I'd like to welcome everyone to today's NAC at Home program. My name is Mitch Case and I'm with the National Arts Club. Today we're joined by Dominic Cayley for a special performance of the Pictures at an Exhibition Suite. Briefly, for those of you who aren't familiar with the club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, and lectures and readings. For more information about the club and upcoming events, you can visit nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And without further ado, Great. Well, um, welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to Los Angeles, which is where I'm streaming from currently. I'd like to thank the Colburn School for generously allowing me to uh, inhabit Zipper Concert Hall right now um, with this fab fabulous Fazioli piano to perform uh, for you today. So as Mitch said, uh, the piece that I'll be featuring today is Mazorsky's Pictures at an Exhibition. I thought this particular work would be quite fitting for an arts club to uh, start with because, again, literally this piece, Picture at an Exhibition, was inspired by an exhibition of paintings that Mussorgsky himself perused and walked around, um, and these works sparked his imagination. So I thought before I play the piece, I'd like to direct your attention at some interesting background and details about this um, pivotal and epic work of the piano literature. So Mussorgsky was a Russian composer, and uh, in his time, he was quite famous. He had a really good friend who was a painter and architect by the name of Victor Hartman. Now, Mitch uh, should have shared a uh, PDF document of all the different uh, paintings in the, in the chat, and you can download that at your leisure to view um, the paintings as I talk about them, but also we will be displaying the, the works as I perform. And if you see me doing a sort of a, a sign, that's, that's to Mitch uh, from California to New York for him to just change the slide. Uh, we're trying that technique today. So about Victor Hartman. Victor Hartman was a Russian artist who was a good friend of Mussorgsky. Unfortunately, Victor Hartman passed away rather suddenly, and Mussorgsky was quite affected by this. So at the memorial service of Victor Hartman, all of Victor's pieces were hanging on the walls and Mussorgsky walked around. And I think seeing these works of his dear friend really affected him. So literally, uh, this piece is a psychological landscape of Mussorgsky and his feelings toward his good friend. You'll see that uh, many of the movements are entitled promenade. Promenade literally means walking. And this is supposed to depict Mussorgsky walking from painting to painting. So you'll hear this theme. You'll hear this theme played many times. But what's very interesting is that this melody is transformed time and time again. So we hear it in a rather robust way like that. We also hear it in a rather sad, more mournful way. We hear it also translated into Latin in a sort of Gregorian chant. So what's interesting to note is that the promenade reflects the psyche of, of Mussorgsky as he walks from painting to painting. So sometimes a painting that he sees makes a big impression on him. He walks away forlorn. He walks away with a sort of um, nostalgic feeling, perhaps. Other times he tries to forget what he saw, and he walks away with confidence and robustness. So um, I think that's what really ties the piece together. And again, you'll hear this, this theme played again and again. It's a little off kilter because Mussorgsky was trying to emulate the way he walked. He was a rather rotund gentleman and he kind of had a bit of a, um, a waddle to his step. So 
sometimes this promenade has a certain um, individuality in its rhythm. Um, but as we look at the paintings, I'd like to draw your attention to a few uh, paintings of note. You'll see paintings by Victor Hartman, which will be uh, labeled um, beneath the title of the painting. You'll also see paintings by other artists. Unfortunately, Victor Hartman's works are not all still surviving. Some were lost, some were destroyed. And so I took the liberty of filling in the blanks with paintings that I felt really mm, portrayed these characteristic movements in the best way. Um, and all the artists are, are given their due credit. The promenades all feature portraits or photographs of Mussorgsky so that you can see him throughout his life. The first portrait of Mussorgsky was actually done by the famous Russian painter Ilya Repin, and it was actually painted only a few days before Mussorgsky's death. So Mussorgsky, um, I find that painting to be quite striking. The next painting that we'll see is the gnome. Now, when you look at this picture of the gnome, it's not a garden gnome like we are accustomed to seeing, perhaps. It's sort of an apparition. It's a grotesque, scary, um, almost creepy-like figure. And indeed, the music reflects that. This is not a gnome who's kind of cheerful. This is a gnome who's threatening. So the music reflects that, and um, the gnome disappears with um, a rather aggressive, uh, tumultuous whirlwind of sound. Another painting of note is the Old Castle. This was not a painting of Victor Hartman's, as you'll see in the document, but rather of Jacob von Rusdale. I found it to be perfect because, indeed, if you look at this painting, you'll see the ruins of an old castle, and in the bottom right corner, you'll see a little red figure, solitary figure. The reason that I find this painting to be perfect is because this melody is being sung by a troubadour. He has his guitar, he's strumming along, my left hand is, is the guitar, and he's singing a lament, my right hand. So I really find this, um, this picture of a troubadour in the ruins of this once magnificent castle to be really fitting for the music. Then there are other paintings that are quite obvious in their intentions. We'll see a children's quarrel, children playing. We'll see a ballet of chicks where uh, actually Victor Hartman kind of conceived of them as being uh, half hatched, where half their body is still in the shell and they kind of dance around and trip around because after all, they haven't learned how to walk yet. Um, we also see a, a wonderful picture by Vincent van Gogh of an ox cart. I found this to be really perfect as well because um, the movement entitled ox cart is supposed to resemble this ox lumbering through the mud in a dark, dreary way. The ox cart comes from the distance. It becomes quite prominent in the music and finally again retreats into the distance. So toward the end of the work, we start seeing um, paintings that are driving to the end. The picture of uh, Goldberg and Schmeil is two men, uh, one a rich man, one a poor man. And in that movement, we'll see a rather stern, confident, arrogant at times uh, personality rep represented by Goldberg and we see um, a trembling, timid, begging uh, man who's, who's um, trying, to, um, trying to appeal to uh, Goldberg's um, empathetic senses. The marketplace is really um, quite a tumultuous affair. We see people elbowing each other everywhere as they, they rush to get items. Um, some, something like a, a toilet paper run at the beginning of the pandemic could be, could be perhaps a, a similar uh, scenario. But uh, indeed here, the marketplace is a wild one in a bazaar. Um, but this marketplace quickly runs and recedes beneath the, the streets into a Roman tomb. Here, in the Roman tomb, Mazorski is quite inventive because he imagines these bizarre chords that are ringing off all of the rock, rocky walls of the tomb, echoing in the chambers. So here, um, the, the piece is quite free in this movement, the catacombs, and we really see Mazorski um, entering into harmonic ambiguity and interest. Following that, we have what's called with the dead in a dead language. The dead language that he's referring to is Latin. And of course, the Gregorian chant, which is something ancient, was sung in Latin. And the theme, the promenade, is transformed into this ominous 
dark music. The final two movements of this, this suite are extremely characteristic of Russian um, folklore and fairy tale. Baba Yaga is a, a rather aggressive witch um, who, in a sort of Hansel and Gretel way, she lives in the forest on her hut with hen's legs. In Victor Hartman's picture, you should notice there's these rather large hen's legs that are a little bit discreetly drawn at the bottom of this hut. She lives there and she chases down children, unsuspecting travelers, in a rather um, frightening way. The middle section of Baba Yaga, though, is her probably at home, maybe stirring a potion or stirring some kind of cauldron as she's concocting some scheme. But Baba Yaga quickly transforms into the final movement, the Great Gate. Now, Victor Hartman was also an architect, so this Great Gate was something he envisioned being built. Um, it never came to fruition, but you can see its significance and its wonderful display of color. One thing to take note of is, is the bell tower in the top right. In Russia, you hear bells everywhere. Bells are a part of life. And indeed, in the Great Gate, we will hear Mussorgsky um, having bells ringing throughout the piano in the most wonderful, magnificent way. And what's really interesting about bells is that if you listen to them closely in, in real life, the bells don't have an exact pitch. When you hit a bell, the pitch kind of wavers around a lot as the vibrations wildly take off. So Mussorgsky decides to be quite inventive, and, he's, and he, he writes these chords that are a little bit more dissonant, but emulate the real essence of a bell sound. So um, I find this piece to be one of the really great journeys throughout um, characteristic movements. So um, please, if you have any questions, comments, um, leave them in the chat. I would be, after I perform, I'd be happy to peruse them and answer any, um, any questions you might have. But um, without further ado, um, this is Mazorski's Pictures at an Exhibition.
Well, hello again. Uh, thank you for joining me on this um, wonderful uh, journey through Mazorski's pictures at an exhibition. And um, I guess I'll take a look to see if there's any questions. Um, and if so, you can still type them in and I can um, answer. Let's see here. Thank you again to everyone that joined. And um, I'd like to really thank, uh, first of all, uh, the National Arts Club for hosting this event. Um, it was really um, a wonderful opportunity to perform in this new environment, in this new la virtual landscape. Um, particularly, I'd like to thank the Colburn School as well. Um, a lot of people made this possible from Annie Wickert and Adrian Daly, who um, basically helped me organize uh, this, this concert hall. Uh, to the wonderful recording team of Sergei, Francesco, and Derek. And of course, uh, Nima, the piano technician of, of Colburn, uh, fabulously worked on this Fazioli for the event today. So um, it was a real pleasure to, uh, to play for you and for you to join me. So um, I, I do see that one person is asking about the history of the composer in the piece. Um, so there's a lot to be said about that. Um, I did talk uh, quite a bit before I performed, but uh, to, to keep it um, a little bit shorter now, uh, Maris Mazorsky was a Russian composer from around the turn of the century in, in uh, the eight, late 1800s to the early 1900s. And he was uh, considered to be one of, one of the big five Russian composers. There was actually five composers who were deemed the big five, the mighty five, the mighty handful. And so Mazorsky was well uh, respected by his peers and he was known particularly for this piece uh, that he composed for the solo piano. In fact, this piece was so popular, actually, that um, later than in the 20th century, a French composer named Maurice Ravel orchestrated this piano piece for a full orchestra with violins, saxophones, percussion, all kinds of instruments. And many people know the piece um, in that format, and they forget that Mussorgsky really did conceive of it for the piano solo. And, you know, we do our best as pianists to make this as orchestral as possible uh, because it certainly it deserves that. Um, let me see. Aha, someone's asking about how I like playing Russian music versus German or French music. Um, it's interesting to note that Russian music, um, particularly around this time period, was um, centered a lot around ballet, around uh, character pieces. There's, a di there's two different types of music. Music that has a story, music that is directly based off of paintings, for example, where you're trying to literally emulate children at play, like this piece, or also composers such as Brahms or Beethoven would write music that didn't necessarily have a direct story. It was more just music for what it was. So these two character music versus um, sort of pure music with no story, those are the two main uh, compositional techniques of composers. And Russian composers, a lot of times, Tchaikovsky, Mussorgsky, even Rachmaninoff, they enjoyed um, writing pieces that sometimes had a painting, a story, a ballet. I mean, Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky or um, again, this is a perfect example of a character piece. So I find that Russian music oftentimes uses you know, more folklore, more folk tunes. I remember speaking with um, a, a Russian woman and after one of my concerts, she had lived in Moscow for many years and I played this piece actually. She had never actually heard the entire piece but she knew the main melody, the because she had just heard that um, in pop culture and it's it just a tune that is, is all over the country. So I, I think that Mazorsky and other composers draw, drew upon uh, certainly folk tunes and other uh, devices to imbue their music uh, with. Um, and certainly French music uh, was also inspired by paintings such as Debussy and Ravel, um, but there's a little bit more of a, um, a watercolor to that music, I would say, at, at times where um, literally Debussy uh, and Ravel want to try and emulate that um, shimmering quality that we'll see in Monet or um, other impressionistic painters. Um, let's see here. Um, ah, someone asked who I studied with and when. Um, I've had wonderful teachers all my life. Um, the first serious teacher I ever had was a, a wonderful Russian woman from St. Louis, Missouri, named Zina Ilyashov. And certainly, I feel like um, her influence has 
been extremely pivotal throughout my entire career because certainly at, at the age of 13, 14, you're a very impressionable young person and uh, I was playing a lot, of, I wasn't playing this piece, but I was playing a lot of Russian music um, when, I was, when I was younger. So I de developed a love for, for this type of uh, style. And um, so Zina Ilyashov, and then I went to the Manhattan School of Music with Andre Michel Shub from 2010 to 2014. And then I studied at the Yale School of Music with Peter Frankel uh, for two years. And then I ended up at the Colburn School uh, where I studied with Fabio Bedini. Um, I graduated from Colburn um, a little over a year ago. And um, I, I, I can't thank all the institutions uh, enough for all that they've given me. Um, and, but, but again, you know, Colburn, I, I really appreciate them offering this, this concert hall today to perform for you. Um, let me see. What is my favorite section to play of this piece? Um, there are many very fun sections uh, in, in this uh, picture, to, uh, an exhibition to play. I would say that. Um, Certainly, uh, there's not many pieces that end with such a rousing conclusion like The Great Gate. So I enjoy uh, the feeling of creating bells with my arms as I'm kind of throwing my arms left and right, you know, in a bell tower, how they, they, they swing the, um, I guess, the metal um, object to, 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 to uh, resonate off the bells. I think that's something that I enjoy doing um, on The Great Gate. So that one's quite fun. Uh, some of these pieces really get into, you know, when I'm playing Baba Yaga, there's a certain amount of terror that I, I feel at times as I'm playing the piece because I, I can feel something over my shoulder perhaps. Or in the gnome, you know, you, you feel this thing creeping about the hall. So that's sometimes fun to have a very visceral reaction to what I'm doing. Um, um, so actually, I see an interesting question about the orchestral versions. Are there more than Ravel's and do I have a favorite? So there are actually, um, I believe there are, are more than Ravel's, but the thing about Ravel's is that he did it so well that um, very few other versions are played. I know of one other. Um, I, 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 I don't remember the name of the um, particular composer who did the arrangement, but he was a student, actually, of, of Ravel. And the funny thing is, the reason that that's not really remembered is because the, the composer, um, Ravel's student, sort of did the opposite. For example, Ravel starts with a trumpet. And the student starts with a string section. So um, I think Ravel really knocked it out of the park, so to speak, with his uh, version. And um, that's my favorite by far. And the other versions I've, I've perused, but mm, as you can see, I don't really remember them. So they must not have left a great impression on me. Uh, so I do recommend uh, the Ravel first and foremost. Particularly, I love his uh, the way he employs the saxophone for the solo in the, great, in the Old Castle. The saxophone has this wonderful, foreign, um, mysterious type sound there. Um, let's see. I seem to have given much more emphasis to the promenade. Indeed, I find the promenade to be the tying factor between all the movements, and I think that it's really important um, to have that motivic uh, theme being heard throughout. I'm sure that you heard it, um, you know, obviously at times. You also heard it more subtly um, in the Great Gate. It makes a small appearance. But again, um, the, the promenade really is Mazorsky. Um, so I think that whenever Mazorsky is able to kind of pop his head up and, and say, here I am, I think it's important to, to, to uh, acknowledge that. Um, and again, I find that returning aspect of it, the constant variation and changing of the promenade to be a really special factor to this piece. Let's see. But um, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think that's all the questions for now. Um, it's it's uh, been, again, a real pleasure to play for you and talk with you today. So um, thank you again to the National Arts Club and to everyone at Colburn who has uh, helped make this event possible. And if you want to watch this again, I understand that it's been recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel of the National Arts Club of New York City. So um, without further ado, I think Mitch would like to make some closing remarks. Yep, just wanted to hop back on and say thank you to Dominic first and foremost. And then I want to say thank you to everybody who joined us today. Uh, as Dominic mentioned, the performance will be posted on our YouTube page. You can just search the National Arts Club performances, um, check nationalartsclub.org. Other than that, wishing everyone a great afternoon. Thanks again, Dominic. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.